Welcome to The Femme Pharmacy. I'm Sammy. And I'm Elizabeth. And we're here to give you access to the leading minds in women's health, bring you groundbreaking research, and share the resources and remedies we've gathered through our multi-year healing journeys. No topic is off limits as we explore the complexities of the female experience. This is a safe space, and we're so glad you're here. Hey. Hello. (laughs) Hello. Back for a solo episode with you guys. That we are. Figured it would be good to be able to go a little bit deeper than we did on our first solo and kind of get into the nitty gritty of our past and also our present Mm -hmm. and just some, you know, kind of relevant things right now that we want to touch on. I think it's great also to do these kinds of check ins with each other as well, especially because we're always, you know, sort of behind the scenes texting and talking about where we're at and troubleshooting what's going on. So it's a it's, I think it's a cool opportunity to allow the listeners into that, you know, community and friendship element that we've built with each other so that people can, you know, hear more about what we're like when we're not interviewing. Yeah. Experts. We want you guys to get to know us more personally and, you know, we're checking in with each other like 18 times a day. So why not do it with the mic and hopefully all of you will benefit from it. I think we should just start kind of in the present, like what's going on now. Um, how have you how have you been feeling? <laughs> you know, it's a little up and down. I would say altogether, my progress is definitely going upwards. And that's what I always have to remind myself. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners can relate to that sensation. Um, and, you know, I've had a few flared days recently. So sometimes when that's happening, it's hard for me to be really positive about where I am. But when I look back to even like April of this year, I was in a very different place. So I think having that as a reminder for me, it's really just kind of figuring out these bladder flares that I have and Mm -hmm. what's causing them. Sometimes you can't even make sense of it. Is it going in the sauna? That seems to be one for me. Why is that happening? Is it a biofilm thing in my bladder? Is it a pH thing? I think I mentioned on a prior episode, like my urine pH is high. Um, So I know that that's causing some burning, regardless of the fact that there's no infection present. I'm also really working on getting my lactobacillus overgrowth down because that can perpetuate the pH issue. They kind of like feed into each other. That pH allows for that lactobacillus overgrowth and vice versa. So, you know, I would say I'm in a better place and my mental health is in a much better place, um, which I really attribute to medication, which we'll get into a little bit later in the episode. That's definitely something I want to touch on and also really taking good care of myself. Yeah. That's a big one. You're really good at that. I, I take a lot of inspiration from Elizabeth and all of her wellness routines. Thank you. (laughs) She is just the best when it comes to eating clean and taking her supplements. Sometimes I can fall off the wagon. So (laughs) I definitely, I, I personally look up to Elizabeth a lot in those ways. Another thing that I look up to you is for your symptom trackers. And I know that you said you had a few flare days recently were you able using your symptom tracker to help you figure out like what maybe some of those causes were? Yeah. So the symptom tracker is something that I really didn't want to do for a while, especially when things were really bad. I almost didn't want to see it on paper. Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. And once I finally did, and I, it's actually like, I wish I could share it with you guys in the notes because I feel like some of you are going to want this. Anyway, hit me on the side if you want it, but it's color coded so that when what I'm filling in is negative. It gets, it's like a heat map. It gets more red. If it's good, it gets more green. So I've definitely seen my chart get more green over time, which is really nice to look back. What a system. And reflect on that green. It's like visually amazing and makes sense and works for you. Like that's just, I feel that's so you. (laughs) The symptom tracker is an extension of my personality. But um, so essentially these last few flares, I think, like I said earlier, these hot yoga classes I'm doing are Mm -hmm. definitely a part of the flares, unfortunately, because they really help my mental health. Um, It's just kind of a matter of me figuring out why is it, am I detoxing something? I don't necessarily know. The other one is I was on a few flights recently and Mm -hmm. like, I know you relate to this, but 
it almost always without fail causes a flare. I noticed that if I do a lot of stretching, even like in the airport, I'm shameless before the flight. That definitely helps. But you know, it's also comes with the territory. And I have to remember that in the healing process, a lot of times I'm taking steps backward. And it's important that you eventually take the steps forward, which I have. So just kind of trying to keep a positive mindset, even when things are burning and not necessarily feeling amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not linear. I, I wouldn't even think about it as taking a step back, but you're perpetually moving forward. Just sometimes it's one step back before it's two, three steps forward. But I think we're both moving, trending in the positive direction. And that's something that I, I really try to hold on to. I wonder with just think, I was just thinking as you were speaking about the about the hot yoga classes. Like, I wonder if it's the detox, like the, the heat making you, you know, purge some of the toxins that could be being held. You know, we've talked about biofilms or even just in the um, interstitial fluid in your body, there's microbes um, like we learned from, from Dr. Rawls recently. But also, yeah. it, I wonder if it if it could have something to do with like, just don't like cells expand in heat and maybe things are, you know, kind of like being released or moving around. Like maybe it's right. just not on right. the move right now. I have been told by my acupuncturist and I don't, I don't want to speak out of term with these words, but I believe I have some heat in my system from an acupuncture standpoint. Okay. And so she at a certain point said like, no sauna, no heat right now. I could be in one of those stages. So that's very possible. I also tend to flare after getting like a lymphatic drainage massage. Mm -hmm. And so there could certainly also be a detoxing element. I'm actually going to do a mold test this week um, on my urine. So there could be that. I've I've had mold show up in the past. I know you have too. Yeah. It's a tricky one. And we're going to have an episode with an amazing duo eventually and really dive into mold because I feel like it's something that needs to be touched on, especially when we're referring to all these bladder issues. It's, it's, it's in such, the such an insidious problem. I was at coffee with a friend recently and she was telling me how she had to move out of her apartment because she ended up getting really sick and not knowing what was wrong with her. And eventually someone that she knew suggested she get tested for mold and she was living in like a horribly water damaged building mm. and was having super scary like neurological symptoms, but also cough and runny nose and some of like the more typical. I feel like with with mold with us, it's something that's like small amounts have accrued in our system over a long time rather than, I don't know about you, but I never got like the respiratory stuff from mold. Yeah. But I feel like this is something that I'm super excited to ask future um, experts that we're bringing on about is like, why some people, you know, accumulate small amounts of mold over a long period of time and end up with these very damaged systems versus like some people are in a in a moldy environment and just get like sick right away. And it's like right. this big reaction. Yeah. I think um, for both of us, mold isn't necessarily a root cause, but it is certainly something that has exacerbated our symptoms, especially given like the link to the bladder and everything. And yeah, it, it all needs to be addressed, right? The toxins that we're putting in our bodies um, or on our bodies, when you get into this heightened sensitive state mm -hmm. and you're already a sensitive person to begin with, it can really push things over the edge. So we're looking at all angles. 100%. Also like with exactly your point and also bringing in the perfect storm element, it's like once you sort of cross over into... I, I'm loath to use like chronically ill mm -hmm. as a um, as a moniker for us, but when you cross over into this sort of space of dealing with chronic health issues and having you know Lyme, um, interstitial cystitis, chronic bladder problems, endometriosis, you name it, like some of the different diagnoses that uh, we've accumulated between the two of us, it's like I almost feel like you become a garbage receptacle for more things. It's like your body just starts collecting different toxic problems. And that, I, I think we should talk a little bit about this idea of the perfect storm and how we sort of ended up 
where we are because I know we we similarly had a few precipitous events that landed us in a chronically ill state mm-hmm. and made us realize all of the toxic issues and the and the health concerns that we had but I think that it, it's super related and then it's like your body holds on to new toxins or it picks up toxins from other places and you be it's like a you know snowball effect you become more and more I also just want to say that I love that we can freely talk about toxins and the need to detox on here because there's a lot of times on social media where I feel like I can't even use the word detox because it has such a diet culture juice cleanse mm-hmm. connotation and you know, there's those memes that are like, we all have a liver. Why would I need to detox? And I just cringe and roll my eyes simultaneously because it must be nice to not have to detox, you yeah. know? And it's not all about like detoxing from the shit food you ate this weekend or the alcohol. There's so much more that goes into it. So anyway, Such I'd, a love good point. To, <laughs> I'd love to get into your perfect storm and sort of like what landed you here in more detail. Yeah. Um, My history is a bit of a complicated one and it goes super far back. I don't remember if I spoke about this in our first episode or maybe I've brought it up separately, but I had a ton of gut issues as a kid. Like I just remember having such stomach issues and that was sort of the first experience that I had with not feeling well. And as I got older, my period came super early. I was like 12 years old when I got Mm. my period and I would bleed for like two and a half weeks a month. Yeah. Like really bad, debilitating cramps. Um, And this is a super common experience for women with endometriosis because a lot of the time it can be hereditary, but a lot of women of a prior generation didn't know they had endometriosis. So there's a lot of um, what's called like normalization of pain. It's it's not gaslighting actually. It's it's a little different because people are under the impression that periods not only can be painful, but it's normal for them to be painful. Mm-hmm. It's not a problem that they're painful. Like the pain it's is in- validated, but it should be there. It's part yeah, of it's, the experience. It's, it's an inconvenience but it's not pointing to a dire situation. And that's something that amongst endometriosis advocates is an idea that just needs to be dismantled Mm -hmm. because telling a 12 year old that it's normal that she's like curled up in bed, screaming, crying, bleeding for two and a half weeks and just, you know, falling apart at the seams, saying that that isn't a manifestation of a larger problem, but that's just, oh, periods are painful that is really challenging to early detection of endometriosis. So that's a huge issue there. But then over the years, things just continued to get worse. I was put on the birth control pill when I was 14, which masked a ton of my symptoms. But then my chronic illness just sort of shifted and I got a tick bite when I was 15. My tick bite, I got the classic bullseye rash. I got super, super sick. My legs locked up Mm. and I couldn't walk for days, but I was on a summer teen tour and they told me nothing was wrong with me, that it was a spider bite, that I'm allergic to spiders. That's what they told me, that I was allergic to spiders. I was having a reaction to the spider. Well, yeah, I was having a reaction because I was bit by something that gave me Lyme, whatever, you know, tick insect it was because I think Lyme can also be given to you from other insects Mm -hmm. and sometimes that's how the bullseye can look different but I digress so then all of these health things just started popping up like chronic migraines I was convinced I had mono I had severe chronic fatigue all these things but I was pretty high functioning like doing well in school I danced 15 hours a week but I had severe body pain like horrible horrible body pain And I would complain constantly. And my parents completely thought I was a hypochondriac because it was like everything under the sun hurt was a problem, this, that, or the other. And I sort of learned how to manage it all. I got really into healthy eating before it was trendy or cool. Like I was trying different diets and different supplements and all this stuff when I was in high school, like in my sophomore, junior year, whatever, because I was like doing all this research and just 
genuinely desperate for something to move the needle, but nothing was really working. And then I sort of let all of that go in college and just like really tried to enjoy myself and was really unwell in a lot of ways, but ignoring it all. So that would be the sort of brewing of the perfect storm. Mm -hmm. And then the impetus for my chronic pain was a mixture of two things. I got a UTI in August of 2018. And I think it woke up my pain receptors to what was happening in my reproductive and genitourinary tract. I think that between the structural issues of the endometriosis growing in places that it shouldn't, there being inflammation and there being neuroproliferation. So actually nerves can grow on the lesions themselves and develop pain receptors. So that was all sort of escalating. Um, endometriosis is a progressive disease. So it grows deeper and deeper into the tissue and becomes more proliferative. And yeah, that sort of landed me in this position where I think the UTI woke a lot of that up. Then the UTI for some reason didn't want to go away. So mm. it was this chronic pain that began. And then I was dealing with a ton of mental health stuff at the moment. My family was going through a lot. I went through a breakup. That was a really, really traumatic time in my life. It was a very publicly traumatic time as well. And I think the um, degrading of my mental and physical health at the same time allowed this perfect storm and all of these problems to rise to the surface, my nervous system to be unable to keep the pain at bay anymore. And then that's how chronic pain materializes and gets out of control. It's so hard because when you're in a perfect storm, you have no idea that it's a perfect storm. You're looking at every individual element and you're trying to fix every separate problem. Yes. And it's like whack-a-mole. And you're like, okay, I have a UTI. Let me take antibiotics and fix this UTI. Well, there's inflammation in my bladder. So I'm going to take prednisone because that's what the urologist told me to do. Well, unbeknownst to me, I have chronic Lyme and prednisone lowers your immune system, allowing Lyme to rise up like an evil beast and become even more problematic to your system. And then you're in more pain and then more infections are getting out of control because your immune system is lowered. And it's like all these individual things that you're doing that aren't looking at the, the greater overall picture end up putting you in a position where things are completely out of control and you don't know what to do first. And you're purely in survival mode from a day-to-day -day perspective, but mm -hmm. also like your emotional system everything is in overdrive and there's no way to zoom out and look at the situation as a whole. And it's a, it's a self-fulfilling, uh, says like not, not a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it fuels itself because pain creates anxiety mm -hmm. and you're anxious and upset and terrified and panicking over what's happening to me. Doctors aren't able to explain this to me. Nothing is working. My life is over. I'm doomed. My body's falling apart. I'm dying. I'm stuck this way. Like who wouldn't be anxious if that's happening right. to them? And it affects relationships too, because mm -hmm. you really at a certain point feel like you have nowhere to go, which is why we really created this podcast space for this because you know there's only so much sympathy people can give right. and it's also hard to find empathy because it's rare to find someone who's been through a similar journey to yours especially given how unique everyone's whole situation is and even if your situation is different just having gone through some similar elements allows people to relate to each other so much more like you and I have a ton of variance in what we've gone through, but there's also so much overlap and then just greater empathy for having been through a struggle that I always feel a thousand times better. Even if I'm sending you a text and I'm like, I'm in pain today or I'm struggling today, or this recent course of antibiotics is really messing with me and making my Lyme that was pretty well controlled start to drive me crazy again. Mm -hmm. And just you being like, I know I get it. It sucks one day at a time. Like, I don't know why that feels so much better to me than like texting my mom who will maybe say something potentially as nice, who knows, but like, it just doesn't feel like she gets it. So I, I really hope like 
on a side note, the people listening to this specific episode that you guys feel seen and validated and like you have a budding community to to join and to gain, you know, that that support system from like we've done for each other. That's exactly our goal. It's this is a space of empathy and understanding and feeling heard and seen even when you're feeling your absolute worst because yeah. it happens. Like even with the amount of progress you and I have both made, we both have dog shit days somewhat frequently and yeah. we text each other pretty much exclusively about it. So true. The perfect storm like really is oof. Oof, it's a tough one. <laughs> so you painted a picture of so many different traumatic things you had going on to your body and your emotional system and everything. What were some of the things that were able to pull you out of that to where you are? Oh my God, that is... I know it's extremely loaded. <laughs> low, loaded question. Um, but people want to know because people are definitely going through a lot of the things that you did. Yeah, I think the first thing that I'll say to that before I get into specifics is that it is so important to have a good care plan. So few women when it comes to these multifactorial complex chronic illnesses with many different precipitating factors don't have good care plans. And you go to a slew of different specialists and they all have their own lens through which they see the manifestation of your pain. And a lot of the times they do want to help. Like they're not bad for mm -hmm. wanting to do an intervention or give you a medication. But if you're not being very proactive about parsing through all of these different elements, then you can end up sort of where I ended up for a really long time, which is deep in this rabbit hole where you're having the kitchen sink of medications and interventions and treatments thrown at you. And you're not really understanding what your root cause is, how to peel back the layers of the onion and find your way to a better state. So like really when, when I took control over my own health was when I started to get better. When I became informed and when I started researching and when I started learning and when my doctors would treat me with respect and tell me that I should go to med school and be shocked at how much I understood, it was because I didn't have a choice other than to build myself up and get them to listen to me, to hear me, and to include me in the decision-making process because I wasn't getting anywhere until then. I was just going to a million different doctors, having a million different things done to me, many of which really hurt me. One of which is this medication that I was on for a while called gabapentin. It is used as a nervous system depressant. It's an epilepsy medication, but it's used for chronic pain. It's supposed to slow down the speed of your synaptic connections and help you if you're in an overdrive state of chronic pain. It doesn't do that, frankly. And the doctors were so desperate to control some of my pain that they put me on a very irresponsible dose. And I was having word recall issues. I was kind of zombified for two years. Mm. And I had to, I actually had to go to rehab to get off of it, which is not something I talk about often, but I, I had- it's an important thing to mention. Yeah. Um, oof, that was a time. I had to go to a detox center to get, it was as hard to get off of for me and for many people um, as narcotics can be. So that was really traumatizing. So traumatic. It was. Um, yeah, I I didn't expect myself to talk about that today, but it was really awful. But there were, you know, other other terrible things as well. Like one doctor was like, oh, you need to get these weekly bladder installations. That's going to take away your bladder pain. And I would go into urinary retention and then have to get catheterized and drained and then get more infections from the catheters. Or like another time a doctor was giving me a nerve block for nerve pain that I had and he accidentally injected into the nerve, damaging the nerve. And it takes six to 12 weeks for a nerve to regenerate. So I was like on my floor 
writhing, crying in pain for like six weeks on heavy duty narcotic pain medication because it felt like a knife was just tearing through me at all moments of the day. And like, let me tell you, I can survive like three days in pain, five days in pain, a week in pain. By that like week Six three weeks. or four where I was still in pain and I didn't know if that feeling was ever going to mm-hmm. go away, I went fucking crazy. As anyone would. My, yeah. So, and then, you know, that adds to the perfect storm. Then your nervous system is even more shot. You're accruing more PTSD medical trauma. It's a real thing. It's something I struggle with and something that I... um you know, I'm still working on for sure. But like back to the the idea of the care plan, it's that I have so many friends, family friends, friends of friends, people who find me on Instagram and they ask me like, what do I do? What did you do? How'd you get better? And I, I always say like, go at it slowly because I went at it fast. I was panicked and freaked out. And, and in I, a lot of pain. And in a lot of pain and desperate. And I, I really wanted to figure this out fast because when you're 23 years old and this is the time in your life when you're supposed to be working and dating and partying with your friends and you're unhappy because you're young and you look good and you're supposed to feel good, but you don't, uh, you're desperate to get back to your life. So I went balls to the wall and it was the worst decision. You have to be strategic. You have to do your best to figure out your root cause and you have to make very, very informed decisions about each thing that you're doing. And, you know, like your uh, symptom tracker and see what results in what. So until I started to slow down and go to honestly go to less doctors, do more for myself and figure out what the main causes were. I was really just on this hamster wheel of hell. Mm -hmm. And then I would say getting the right endometriosis surgery was paramount. Like probably the number one thing for me getting to where I am today because so many of the interventions that I was doing like pelvic floor physical therapy, for instance, it's a great tool and it helps so many women. And it is a wonderful intervention that people can do. But when your muscles are distorted because your organs are glued together from scar tissue and adhesions from this disease, it's an unwinnable battle for pelvic floor physical therapy to be able to help you. And then I'd have these chronic infections because my body was in in an unhealthy place and the tissue would be inflamed. And pelvic floor physical therapy, not only was it expensive, but I would flare all the time because the tissue was inflamed and it would be irritating the tissue. And it was just like all these things. Like I I just, I wouldn't say I did them wrong, but I, I did them in a non-opportune way. So it was really getting that endometriosis surgery, which removed almost all the disease from me, unstuck my organs from each other, allowed my body to finally be able to start to calm down and heal. Mm-hmm. And then getting my cro- getting my chronic Lyme diagnosis. So once I found out I had Lyme, they asked me, did you ever have a bullseye rash? I remembered, oh yeah, there was a weird thing that I had when I was 15. Oh, okay, that all makes sense. So starting to implement different Lyme protocols and those kinds of things. And then figuring out what the problematic infections that I had was, was really, really important as well. Like we've spoken about urea plasma. Urea plasma, a lot of the time people think it's either a chronic UTI or chronic yeast. And you have these symptoms and your doctor is giving you more and more rounds of antibiotics and antifungals. And the tests results aren't really showing you anything, but you still have all those symptoms Mm -hmm. and the doctors keep giving you medication. And then sometimes the symptoms will wane a little bit and then they'll come back. And I think I must've had urea plasma for a really long time because it wasn't until I did the specific antibiotic protocol for urea plasma, did a lot of my quote unquote vulvodynia symptoms and like weird yeast slash UTI, burning, itching, um, sort of like muscular discomfort. Mm-hmm. A lot of that resolved with getting um, getting the urea plasma under control. Yeah, I think 
this idea that we need to be our own advocates comes into mind in a huge way here. And I really don't even think that being your own advocate summarizes what most of us in the chronic illness world have to go to. Like that is just the very tip of the iceberg. But unfortunately, a lot of people listening, I would say the majority probably know what it feels like the, that moment when you all of a sudden no longer are like, oh, I just go with what the doctors tell me. Mm -hmm. That moment when you're like, this is actually a hundred percent on me, unfortunately. And I can't just listen to my doctor that said, this is anxiety or your UTI test is negative. All of a sudden it switches from their hands to yours. And it's up to you to, to Sammy's point, to meticulously go through the resources, the research, the doctors and, and determine exactly what it is that's wrong with you and then find your community mm -hmm. and start getting answers there. For me, my perfect storm was, you know, a little bit different than Sammy's in that it started really during COVID and it started with UTIs. Urea plasma was in that mixture. And I want to really make sure that we touch on that enough because it's important. And I think it really messes with the whole genital tract, all of it, urinary, every piece of it gets touched by urea plasma. And I, I just want to say one thing about urea plasma before you continue that I think is so important is that it's not often tested for. Mm -hmm. So it can be an underlying factor in your pain perfect storm and people can go years without knowing because it either takes you reading about it somewhere and asking your doctor to test you for it or if you're lucky landing in the hands of a doctor who is like okay well your tests are, are negative otherwise but there is this one thing urea plasma it could be a problem let's check it out right and you might not need to be treated for it again that's when you have to make that switch of while this doctor certainly has my best interest, they may not have all of the resources and the knowledge and the training that I need for this particular set of problems. And that was so a big, true. that was a huge thing for me. Um, so developing that, these chronic UTIs that then built biofilms that I then couldn't penetrate them with antibiotics, but I didn't know that because how would a 27 year old girl living in New York City know about biofilms mm -hmm. when I have no kind of science background? So most doctors don't even like think about biofilms when it comes to chronic UTIs. Yeah. And so I eventually discovered PCR testing, which again, not something a doctor would have ever brought up. It was very basic testing. Oh, everything looks good. No issues. I know that there's an issue. I am mm -hmm. in pain there. This is not my baseline. So then I discovered the testing. So now I'm discovering that there's, while there's no urea plasma anymore, because thankfully the antibiotic combination that I finally was able to get my hands on per asking for it, got rid of it. But now I've got all of these different co-infections that the urea plasma or the chronic UTIs caused, which again, not something that I would have ever understood unless I spent nights on end in Reddit and Facebook groups, mm -hmm. which is just a huge problem in its own. Oh my God, but I'd stay up all night reading. It's addicting too. And it also kind of fuels the chronic pelvic pain. I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate to that. So it's this double-edged sword where you need to be in there and you need to be getting information and being an advocate for yourself. But it's also triggering mm -hmm. and, and all-consuming and can lead to a lot of catastrophizing. And, and you were alone in COVID, which right. is... That fueled the storm. Rough. I didn't realize at the time that I had mold. I didn't realize at the time that I had Lyme. So I didn't understand the toll that my immune system had already taken. Mm -hmm. So then you add in these chronic infections that weren't properly treated because I couldn't get access to a doctor. I was just taking random antibiotics to be totally transparent. Then I developed candida from all of the antibiotic overuse. So it was a slew of problems that came in really hot. I had also gone through a breakup. So I was living a, a very long relationship ended. And so I moved into a place by myself. COVID hit. All of these problems started. And I was alone, absolutely petrified of COVID in my apartment for months on end. When I tell you guys that I didn't see anyone for multiple months at a time, like my business partner would come and wave to me from the window because I was too petrified to go downstairs. Terrified. So the medical trauma also shows in different ways of, I was so afraid given that I was immunocompromised because I also have a heart condition, which is a story for another day. 
that I thought COVID was going to kill me. And so I stayed by myself and completely deteriorated my mental health. So a perfect storm can look a lot of different ways. For me, that's, that's how it went. And the testing and discovering these tests, like I was saying, was really imperative to my success in healing or at least gathering information so mm-hmm. I could heal. But I even flew all the way to Kentucky to see a specialist at one point. And I knew what was going on with me at the time. I had the information in front of me. It was E. coli. It was enterococcus. These were co-infections that had formed. And he wanted to put me on two years of amoxicillin. Oh my God. And I was this close to doing it because when you're in that position and you feel like your back is against a wall and a medical professional who is famous for, for helping with chronic UTIs, and I do think he actually does amazing work for some people, but to not take biofilms into account, which form over time as you continue to hit these infections with the wrong antibiotics. And some people are more susceptible to building biofilms. And I happen to be one of those people. I now have that information through my current practitioner. But at the time, I didn't know that. And I was very close to taking the antibiotics. And it turns out now that I've chipped away at those biofilms, which by the way, when I started doing that, more bacteria started showing up on these tests. So now I'm taking the biofilm disruptors. And all of a sudden, Klebsiella and Morganella are showing up. And where were those all along? Mm -hmm. Hiding in the biofilms. So you really learn a lot over time as you are advocating for yourself. And I think that identifying the, the testing, first of all, and then identifying the biofilm issue, and then kind of meticulously taking down the bacteria through that biofilm with antibiotics and herbs has been what's really worked for me over time, slowly. Wow. There's like so, so much to unpack there. Something that really comes to mind for me in this conversation is that a lot of the diagnoses that you get in this chronic pelvic pain sort of universe, they don't really mean anything, right? Like it's common knowledge that IBS doesn't actually mean Mm -hmm. anything. It just means stomach pain. Well, vulvodynia just means vaginal pain. Interstitial cystitis just means bladder pain. Mm -hmm. None of this stuff really actually tells you what is going on and what the best way to deal with it is. So I accrued a list of like 12 diagnoses, central sensitization, like interstitial cystitis, vulvodynia, like all these pudendal neuralgia. Like, what does that mean? The pudendal nerve is a nerve that innervates the genitourinary tract. And it's basically just something that they tell you you have if you have nerve pain in that area. Well, I had endometriosis lesions on the ligaments that were inflaming the nerves and making me have pain in that area. But the treatment for pudendal neuralgia, which I did, are nerve blocks. I didn't need nerve blocks. I needed someone to properly excise my endometriosis that was inflaming the nerves and making me have nerve pain. It got to the point where I flew to Switzerland and considered having nerve surgery on my lower back because I was convinced that my endometriosis was not the problem and that it was nerve nerve surgery that I needed. No, I needed a doctor who had the wherewithal to give me a proper excision surgery. There's so much room for error when these are huge surgeries and treatments that we're talking about here. And like I said before, when your back is against a wall and the pain is a 12, you kind of fall into this space of being vulnerable and susceptible to accepting your fate being these surgeries, especially Mm -hmm. with all of these blanket umbrella terms of chronic pain under different lenses of whether it's the bladder or the nerve or the whatever it may be. It's really destabilizing to feel like you're having to make these decisions and without any kind of guidance. And that's something that we really want to bring with this podcast. And I don't know what form it will take in the future, in addition to this, of kind of being able to create these care plan is like the wrong term, but yeah, like like an actionable sort of 
not like a, not a list, a but guide? a guide. Yeah. Something I don't, uh, this comes to mind because I was helping a family friend recently navigate this. And she was like, well, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I get the nerve block? Should I be in pelvic PT multiple times a week? Should I go to this doctor? Should I go to that doctor? And I was like, whoa, slow your horses. Take this test because if you have this bacteria, that could be the cause. Go to this surgeon because if you have endometriosis, like he will be the one who can help you. Find out if this is the problem before you go and you try and get the treatment or you let a very narrow perspective physician to convince you to do the thing that they know how to do. Right. And there's so many like, If this, then that. Mm -hmm. If you test positive for this, it takes you down this track. If you test positive for that, it's this track. If you, and these things, like the vagina is so sensitive. So, like, even as broken down as taking the wrong probiotic, if you have, I always say this word wrong, cytolytic vaginosis, cytolytic, cytolytic vaginosis, which means that you have an overgrowth of lactobacilli. Yeah, it's basically you have an overgrowth of lactobacilli and lactobacillus can um, emit different particles essentially. And those particles can degrade the tissue of the vagina. So you end up in this situation where you're basically like eating away at your own tissue. So anyway, it really burns. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> look more into that if you're having this because also urea plasma, I believe, causes this in a lot of people. But it's such a delicate balance of me taking the wrong probiotic at the time was actually, I thought I was like doing good things and I was fueling the lactobacillus that happened to be overgrowing. So just having a guide in place where if you're having this kind of burning, check for this and then avoid these two things. Like we're working on it, but we know you guys need this. And it would be our absolute pleasure and honor to be able to handhold people through this process because unfortunately for us and fortunately for you, we have really been through a lot of different varieties of- I've tried everything. All of it. (laughs) I mean, from Botox in the pelvic floor muscles to, you know, nerve blocks in my spine to bladder installations to every medication on planet earth to different surgeries to lasers that are supposed to rejuvenate vaginal tissue like I have legitimately tried it all and there's a lot to try but there's a lot that can hurt you yeah and um we welcome the fact that we're your guinea pig <laughs> I mean I would have killed for this so let's just utilize our past experiences to help people here Yeah. I feel like we did that too with each other a lot in the beginning. I was like, one of the first things that I said to you when I reached out to you, I was like, Hey, I, you know, I see that you're dealing with, with IC is what you think you have. I was like, let me know like what you're thinking of doing. And I'll let you know if I've done it and if it helped me or hurt me. Cause I'm like, I'm now, I feel like like this like mama bear protective need to tell people like, no, 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 like don't don't do that. that. Like it is (laughs) it is traumatizing at times. And there's this new thing that Sammy and I keep getting served Instagram ads on. (laughs) What is it called? Lactomedi. Lactomedi. If anyone (laughs) has tried it, please hit us up because it looks to be like exactly what we need. It essentially like it's a vaginal insert that has lactobacilli in it, but the good kind, as well as like tea tree oil and things to calm things down in there. And it has insanely rave reviews on the website, but we can't really get a gauge on where it came from, who it's made by. And we just feel like we need more information. So we were thinking about trying it in solidarity (laughs) with each other, just in case things go really wrong. We can at least have each other to talk about it with slash. We will definitely keep you guys updated, but But if we discover the cure by like being guinea pigs and trying it on ourselves and like, we will definitely do an episode on it and let you guys know if it, um, if it's worthwhile. A hundred percent. I want to get on into the mental health component of all of this because obviously the perfect storms that we both described are very traumatic and you and I have both been really through it when it comes to our mental health. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> what? <Yes. laughs> what? Where to even start really with this piece? Bluff. I mean, I will say that I'm someone who has always run anxious. I can remember my first anxious day in kindergarten. And 
it's just kind of always been a person, part of my personality being hypersensitive and hyper anxious. You just start to kind of identify with that when you're told it at a young age. Um, I mean, were you called hypersensitive as a kid? Oh my God. It was like my identity within my family. Wait, me too. And I, I still to this day take such offense to it. Well, I'm working to not because it really is a superpower. But Wait, I do too. We've never talked about this. Were you the kind of kid that like seams on your socks would drive you crazy? Or like your parents had to cut your tags off of was, all your t-shirts because you'd go crazy if you could yes. feel it on your skin? Like that my mom me. chopped my hair into a literal, um, what is that called? Like a bowl cut? A bowl cut. No, because like a waspy I was, little boy. <laughs> yes, because I, yeah, I got to show you pictures. Because I was so sensitive to like her doing my hair and pulling it wrong or not having it be perfect. Like she was like, great, this is what's going to happen. We're going to chop your hair off. Not ideal, (laughs) but yes, hypersensitive. I also like how many of you guys out there are also this way? Because I do think that there is a link that isn't being touched on enough to all of these different illnesses, diseases, hitting people that are hypersensitive in a different way. Mm -hmm. Um, So anyway, back to the anxiety hypersensitive childhood, started doing therapy probably around 25 after a really traumatic cheating breakup, had multiple therapists tell me that I should start medication. I was super opposed at the time. I'm going to be transparent about that. I thought this isn't for me. I really try to live an all natural lifestyle. I was borderline offended by the suggestion, which I know is so wrong, but it wasn't until this summer that I really hit a wall with my anxiety. It was affecting my relationship. It was affecting my work. And I came to Sammy and I asked her about it. And she really encouraged me to start a low dose. I started Lexapro. And it was really helpful to be able to speak to someone who I know is equally as sensitive and has been through it in a very similar way to me because I'm not someone who can just take birth control. It messes with literally everything. Same. <laughs> so it, it's it's different. You know, those people that can just kind of take whatever and mm-hmm. like they feel good and they look good. Oh, I get every side effect possible. If there is a side effect in <laughs> yes. existence to something, I will feel it and it will happen to Immediately. me. Immediately. Yeah. So I knew I could trust the recommendation coming from her. I also had the support of, you know, my partner as well as some friends. And that was really helpful. And I started five milligrams of Lexapro. I'm going to be specific because I know people are going to ask. And I got really lucky that that was the right dose and medication for me because I know that a lot of people try a lot of different things. And it has substantially decreased my daily anxiety. And it's been amazing. And I, I, I know it's not for everyone, but I just want to add this into this kind of conversation around what's been working for us because I never would have thought that this would have worked for me. Mm-hmm. No, I'm... I'm so happy to talk about this. I, for years, also refused to take um, any antidepressants. And I didn't think that... I, I, You know what, actually? I thought that by... Succumb, I saw it as succumbing to them, which is entirely unfair. If you jump out of an airplane without a parachute, you will die. Sometimes you need like a little bit of help. And when you're going through something as challenging as the things that we've gone through, it is okay to have a parachute. But I saw it as succumbing to it. And I also, because my perfect storm involved a very traumatic series of events in my life, I was always very sensitive to doctors saying that it was all in my head or calling my pain a manifestation of my anxiety or the issues that were going on with my family or et cetera, et cetera. So I was always partially scared that the antidepressants would make things better and then it actually would be and would have all been in my Mm. head. And I didn't, I didn't, didn't want that to be the case. As I got further in my journey and I got the validation of the endometriosis diagnosis via laparoscopic surgery, I got the validation that there were multiple chronic infections going on. Then I was like, okay, no one can say that this is in my Mm -hmm. head and maybe I do need some support. And then I think needing to get off the gabapentin and needing some sort of secondary support for like myself in doing that made me finally like take the leap and agree to taking 
Laxapro. And I also really believe in finding like your lowest therapeutic dose. Mm -hmm. A lot of the clinical studies on these kinds of medications are done in men or are done in people who aren't as sensitive or are different than us. And you really don't need to be on 20 milligrams. You don't need to be on 15 milligrams. Some people only need five. What's interesting is that five is technically considered Mm subtherapeutic. I've had doctors that tell me that it's placebo. I don't believe it's placebo. I feel a big difference in my baseline anxiety. I'd still get anxiety. I still get upset. I'm not a zombie. I still feel all my emotions, but I have a little bit more help through them. And I think that that's where something like Lexapro can be really useful in your overall toolkit. It's not a silver bullet. It's Mm -hmm. not a one size fits all, but it definitely can be helpful. And something that I struggle with and that I'm trying to figure out currently is PMDD. And that's premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So a lot of people know about PMS, but PMDD is where it's so intense that for like five days before your period comes, you're just kind of like an entirely different person. It's almost like this depressive episode, this black cloud that comes over my life. I'm crying. I don't know why I'm upset. I'm like so sensitive. Any like sad thing that I see on the street sends me over the edge. Like it's just, it's not good. And Dixie D'Amelio, actually, you sent me a video, um, came out recently about how destabilizing it was for her. And it's something that's really difficult because it only happens for a few days a month. And then the second your period comes, it's like the sky is clear and blue right. and there's sun again. Like it is that intense and that stark of a contrast that you end up on like a bit of like this emotional roller coaster where you don't even know what's really happening to you because it's totally out of your control and it's this very up and down thing. Lexapro is one of the things that has helped me, but I still experience it. Lexapro is not going to be the only thing that helps me in this PMDD journey. It's I'm going to have to really figure out how to balance my hormones, how to stop the inflammatory cycle of when progesterone levels change in my body, how that affects my mental health. I mean, all these things are are super interconnected and I'm working on it and I would love to do a PMDD episode uh, one day, especially when I get further along in my journey. But the, the sort of long-winded point of that is that there's not a one-size-all solution, but there are things that can be really helpful to try with the right support and with the right information. And I feel like five milligrams was something that you were willing to try. It was something that didn't feel overwhelming or scary to Mm -hmm. you. And I'm so glad that I was able to help you get to a place where now you're on it and it's, and it's doing wonders for you. Yeah. I think it's something that you almost forget you're taking because Mm -hmm. you just get used to feeling a little bit better. And to Sammy's point, it's not a silver bullet. I don't feel so different, but there's little things that will happen where I'm like, oh, that would have really bothered me before. And I can sort of just let it go. And even the example of like being able to drive, I had a really big fear of driving and all summer I was driving or public speaking. And I know this isn't like a beta blocker by any means, but it has sort of lowered my baseline anxiety to the level where I can get up in front of a group of 50 women and say a few words without it taking over my entire body and personality before the event starts. So kind of like riding an e-bike. Yeah. It's like you just exactly. you got a, you still got a little bit of help. Yeah. You're yeah. still pedaling. The hills are still tough. You can still get out of breath, but like there's something that's making it just a little smoother. Totally. So if it's something that you guys are considering, I I hope that this can be of inspiration to you all because it's not as scary as it's as it may sound if it's mm-hmm. not something you're familiar with and it really has, I think, changed both of our lives. Yeah. Without a doubt. I want to also talk about, you know, just as we're on the topic of things that are working for us, you and I have definitely created this treasure trove of products. Mm-hmm that have and have not worked and (laughs) we share them amongst us. I have some in my bag for Sammy right now. Like these things are also a little hard to find and get your hands on. Mm -hmm. So when something works and you're in need of it because of a certain 
you know, where you are in your cycle or whatever it may be, you like need it when you need it. Yeah. I mean, we, I am product obsessed in life, whether it's hair care, skin care, makeup, et cetera. And something that I always get very angry about is how easy it is to shop for products when it comes to beauty. Or like, anything else or other basically than women's anything, health. Yeah, like going to CVS or Walgreens and trying to find anything decent there and get any information on those products, know the ingredients, et cetera. Like it's just, it's, it's an entirely different experience than like going to Sephora and shopping for foundation. If you do that, you can find out every different undertone, every ingredient in every different foundation. You have an educated section. Yeah. You have an educated retail staff who's like helping you the whole time. Like, let me help you this. Let me help you that. Like We do not have that with women's health and it is so unfair. So that is something that like really grinds my gears, so to speak. And there are so many incredible products out there that are so helpful for different um, problems that you might face or just like things that you need every day, like organic tampons. I preach this all the time. Everyone should be using organic tampons. You should not be absorbing glyphosate and chlorine and bleach into the skin and the organs around like your reproductive tract. You should just not be doing that. Remember when like scented tampons were a thing? Oh my God. It like makes, it Literally makes me burn infection just waiting to, to think happen. about it. Cool. <laughs> But anyway, the, yeah, so, and also, so not only is just the availability, but it's education and discovery around the products is such, such a missed opportunity. Like all these products exist on their own websites. It's all fragmented and segmented into their own spaces. And you can end up like never finding that a product that could help you exists. So yeah, some of the products that we've been using recently that are super helpful for us um, I would love to chat about. One is um, anything with CBD in it. I find really helpful when my cramps are really bad. Foria CBD suppositories. Great brand. A great brand. My bladder was flaring recently. I put a, I actually put a THC salve because mm. THC can be really helpful in um, numbing pain receptors. I put that on my pubic bone and it helped a ton. So like these, you know, sort of CBD slash THC vaginal wellness products are great. Foria is definitely my favorite of the brands, but there are a ton out there. Totally. I have definitely become a Foria girl because of you. Um, and also that Momotaro solve that you mm-hmm. s- solve that you showed me is amazing for like literally any kind of burning. It's so soothing. And I was so afraid to like try anything too, because Again, it's so sensitive down there. And normally I just use like coconut oil or something that I know is definitely not going to flare me. No, it's awesome. And it has so many remedies in it. It has um, Oregon grape, which is rich in berberine, something that we talked about with one of our herbalists. It has tea tree oil, which is antibacterial, it has centella asiatica, which is super soothing to the tissues, calendula, shea, anti-inflammatory properties. So like whether you're irritated post-sex or you f- went swimming and feel like a slight uh, yeast tickle. infection, tickle, yeah, yeah, the tickle. <laughs> when you know the tickle's coming. Or UTI coming on, it can, it can nip things in the bud. So just having these things on hand really allows you to become an autonomous um, like healer for yourself. And it's really important to like have knowledge and access around a lot of these products. A hundred percent. Non-toxic it, lubes and condoms, super important. I get super irritated from condoms. Right. As I think a lot of us do and no one's talking about it. Mm-hmm. I think for me, some big ones are Eucora probiotics, mm-hmm. using them as suppositories. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah, it's a game changer. I do it like once a week if I'm feeling burning and it balances out that lactobacillus overgrowth. And Actually, I use the Eucora um, body wash. People love their stuff. Yeah, it's I'm great. like new to it, but yeah. people, I've, I've heard a lot of positive. It has lactic acid in it, which is really good for balancing the vaginal pH. A lot of conventional body washes, like anyone out there who uses Summer's Eve, throw it in <laughs> Burn it. the trash. <laughs> throw it away. Um, yeah, a lot of these body washes can 
give people yeast infections and UTIs because it throws off the pH or it introduces chemicals um, or different like scented, you know, things, whatever. And it's really important to be using pH balancing, non-toxic, non-surfactant, uh, which means like non-soaping um, body washes. A hundred percent. I think um, having a toolkit of just a few little things, even if it's just a CBD suppository and a probiotic and maybe a salve, like even when you're traveling, just to know that you're empowered to at least take your symptoms down a couple of notches mm -hmm. is major. I, I think that's half the battle is being able to assemble that toolkit. And what's so exciting is that for me, I get really excited about this personally, is there's so much innovation in the space right now. And I think because I'm so interested in this space, I get targeted a lot. Mm -hmm, but they know. <laughs> they do. They do. They listen. But really, like I'm seeing such interesting things out there that I'm hopeful that the entire, similarly to the clean beauty category, that the innovative femme care personal hygiene space, I think is about to blow up. Like I saw recently, there are hyaluronic acid suppositories for vaginal dryness. I mean, how many of us out there use hyaluronic acid serum for our faces? Right. Well, the fact that now someone was like, let me make a suppository for hyaluronic acid that can help plump up and um, hydrate the vaginal tissue, which is especially great for postmenopausal women, mm -hmm. especially ones who can't use hormones if they're um, cancer survivors or have cancer run in their families, et cetera. So, you know, there's, there's so much that's out there that's currently being made. It's just, it can be challenging to, to find them and to, to trust the efficacy too of the products. That's why education is so important around these things. Right. Not everyone has a good friend who's over there being the guinea pig. Mm -hmm. So we want to be those friends for you guys. <laughs> Come join, join our little friendship. Yeah, please. We welcome you here. So I think that's pretty much everything that we wanted to cover today. Yeah. We we are kind of new to the solo episodes and we definitely eventually want to have you guys like submit questions for us and sort of be able to cater to exactly what you all want to hear. Um, but we're trying to make this helpful for you. We really mm -hmm. want to, like I said earlier, I, I overuse this term, but add to your tool belt and, you know, just have everyone making more empowered decisions via the things that we've tried and the information that we're able to provide. Yeah. And I didn't necessarily expect uh, for either of us to be as vulnerable as we were. But once you start talking about these things, you realize that so many women are struggling with it and they don't have the language to speak about it. So my hopes also, if anyone out there listening, is that you feel comfortable to speak up for yourself and to say something and to ask for help because we're we're all in this together. We are so many of us are struggling and it is normal. You should not feel like there's something wrong with you. You should ignore all the stigmas that are out there and just really empower yourself through the spread of knowledge and through connecting with community around this. A hundred percent. We really believe in, in our pain and our journeys becoming our biggest asset. So everyone that's listening is no exception to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thank you guys for listening, for joining our women's health universe and for, you know, allowing us to share with you guys. We, we thank you too. See you guys next time. Bye.